Uh, Philippe, welcome to Utah Valley University. Uh, we just watched your film. What did you guys think of it? Do you like it? I'd never watch it without crying. It could be recording the front. people applauding, though, because I can't see them, so you could just, like... I know, I that. know. They'll come down. Yeah. They're, okay. They're, <laughs> um, they're, they'll come down and talk to you individually, so you don't have to look at, like, the whole group and act like you're teaching a class, which is... This is a little more intimate. So, um, so I'm really honored to have you. Uh, as I was gushing before about you, uh, uh, I'm a huge fan of... Um, I've only seen the two of your films. I know you've directed maybe six or so. Um, uh, Monsieur uh, Lazar. I'm yeah. mixing your name up and his name up is the problem. <laughs> and um, and is such a beautiful film, so charming and just so moving. Um, and that's what I wanted to ask you uh, about first because I feel like I'm going to guess that this film was brought to you. That that they found you as a potentially great director for this film, and I feel like they made a great choice uh, based on that film, based on uh, Monsieur uh, Lazar. <sighs> yes, Lazar. And um, and uh, can you so can you talk about that and about how you came to this project and where it was when you were. Uh, uh, you know, as you came on board and uh, sort of what that experience was like? Well, I guess that Monsieur Lazar was pertinent uh, for two reasons. It, it dealt with uh, immigration, but also it, it staged um, kids. Right. And the good lie had the two components in, in the project. But, uh, and, and of course, the fact that Monsieur Lazar was, was uh, uh, reached a, a very wide audience in the world and also went to the Oscar, helped me get uh, the gig indeed. But <laughs> strangely, the producers didn't offer it to me directly. How it happened is that I, I, I after Mr. Lazar, I, uh, I had an agent in, in, uh, in Los Angeles and he would send script my way knowing what interested me. And when I read that, it, it felt very intimate and, and personal because I had been to South Sudan during the war in 96. Uh, um, I was uh, doing a camera work for a documentary filmmaker who was doing a, a film on Unger at that time for wow. the National Film Board of Canada. And so I was at the heart of the conflict during the time where the when the kids had to start moving away from their families and, and homes. Um, and also, uh, we were, we had been evacuated one day uh, because a rebel army was coming, well, not a rebel army, but a loose cannon army uh, was coming our way to pick up the food that the, the UN had just dropped in the village. Uh, and the food had not been distributed yet. And one day I wake up and 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 I, I'm told you need to be evacuated. And so we left with a very sour feeling that we couldn't finish the film and that we were leaving behind the people uh, which we wanted to to you know film and tell their story. So when I read the script, that was 18 years later, almost 18 years later, and I. I thought this is a way to redeem myself and finish the job and tell their story and perhaps to a, a wider audience. Um, and and uh, so my agent got me in the same room with the producers uh, and I had I brought the, the pictures I had I'd, I'd made of these kids back then. So it was kind of, uh, um, it, it, I made it very, I made my pitch very intimate in a way that, I don't think we even discussed on the first meeting how I would stage it, except for the fact that I was I was adamant about one thing. I said, if we are to do this film, we should take real refugees um, because they have something in them that is almost impossible to to play for professional actors. Sure. And also because South Sudanese people look like they are so tall and so you know their 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 physical uh, traits are are very pronounced. So and they they went along with it and and that's how the project came about. Wow! Wow! So there were those photos at the end. Were they your photos? 
Uh, no, those photos were taken by Dan Axe from uh, from the Netherlands. Uh, beautiful photos as well. Yeah. He went there on on a on a separate project, and and uh, I met him on the set, and and he he uh, he gave some some photos for the for the ending, which were very fitting uh, because we really wanted to tell the audience that what they saw was a reenactment and it was not it was not like their personal stories, but they live through these events in, in, in many ways. So tell us about <clears throat> tell us about production a bit. Uh, well, first, let's talk about the, the, the Sudan and, and African sequences. Uh, so before I get into that, let, let me ask you about working with children, because you uh, you're great at it. Uh, in the previous film, wonderful child performances in this one, same thing. Um, and what, how do you like to do that? I mean, what, what are, what is the secret to your success? It's time. <laughs> I, I wish I had a secret. I was lucky also, I think, uh, to, to work with talented young actors because at that age, you don't, you don't ask them to just, it's, it's not like asking an animal to do a trick. They know what's going on. They understand the script. They had their own way. Uh, to read the script and they they see things differently, but they they understand what's happening and they understand what it's about. So you work with them like you would work with a, an adult actor, but you you, you need more time. You need to, more time to audition them. You need more time to find the right children. You need more time to rehearse, and you need more time on the set because you have to give them more pauses, and you need you need to give them school during. The, the the day actually and and I remember in Africa we were outside and 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 when they had their time for school they were under a tree it was re really romantic and they were doing like English or mathematics where we we were setting up the other shots so you just need more time also I worked with uh, on Monsieur Lazar with a, a a coach who was very very good with with children uh, because they don't speak the exact same language as we do and they need to be entertained all the time and as a director you need to oversee the complete production so you don't have time to play with them although i would do some of that myself because i i do like to do that to to clown around um but i think that the secret is really to 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 give yourself time to make sure that they they are treated as equal and to have fun in in we do say play uh, an actor what does he do in what does he do in life he plays and and a, a, a child understand what playing is it comes right. naturally to him right. or her great and were they cast locally the children were cast all over america in communities in south sudanese community we we uh, i had hired a, an amazing casting director uh, who you know prepared this this itinerary, and we went on the road, and and we ca we, we we called the, the the our 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 little van, the, the cast mobile, and we went to Phoenix, we went to Des Moines, we went to Atlanta, we went to Kansas City, to to audition kids from real refugees. Of course, the kids were born in the United States. What was funny was that the kids they didn't speak the language; they had to learn it phonetically. Mm -hmm. And but they heard their parents speak their 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 mother mother tongue, uh, but they heard that story from their parents, of course, and 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 most of the time they heard it at some as something that you know parents complain about about how how life was harder back then and and their life was so easy, and then by reenacting what their parents had had gone through, especially like in scenes like where you have to, to, to swim across the river while there's body floatings, these children like uh, started to understand what their, their parents uh, went through. And all the adults were actually real uh, lost boys and, and lost girls. Yeah, so, um, <clears throat> so with, the, with the children, you flew, where did you film it? Uh, so we, we shot, uh, you mean the African sequences? Yeah. yeah. We shot in uh, South Africa because uh, South Sudan was out of bound for security reasons. And we did shoot a few shots in, in uh, the, the Kakuma, the real Kakuma refugee camp. 
uh, with uh, I brought the actor who played Mamer and and uh, Jeremiah uh, Gare Giovanni, the, the, the very tall guy, and we went for only one day in the real refugee camp. But the rest of the scenes, we rebuild the refugee camp in South Africa, and all the other sequences were were shot there. And um, you you start scouting, and you start scouting for a river in Africa, and and the the, the problems are so. You know, they, they first of all, there's of course the security, the current, and then you have to look out and test the river. Are there any parasites? Are there any predators? Are there any <laughs> crocodiles? So you know, these questions you normally don't ask. And in addition to that, none of the kids knew how to swim. So we had a boot camp in Atlanta with an amazing stunt coordinator uh, who taught the children uh, how to swim. Mm. Wow. And how was it for the parents who traveled with their children to Africa to see this reenacted? Was it well? It was. It was. It was. It was difficult for them uh, when we arrived on the set of the village. Uh, a lot of them became very emotional, and and uh, most of them uh, were uh, used as extras. So they participated in the scene where the village got burned. Oh, so you can oh. imagine for them what it meant because the last time they, they lived through that was for most of them the time where they saw their parents killed. And they, 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 they ran away just amongst uh, children and never saw their families again. So it was an emotional time for them. Yeah, I bet. Yeah, I bet. But okay. they, they needed to do that. They, they, they asked me to do that. Of course, I would... I mean, I would. They, most of them asked me to 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 play in in the movie, and one of the parents plays actually two roles. He plays uh, the guy who's in the refugee camp and doesn't leave. His name is not on the list, uh -huh. and plays also the wounded man with the crushed legs under oh, yeah. a tree. So we we shaved his head. So he played two roles. He was a very good actor. Yeah, he was. Are you, are you waiting to ask a question? Yeah. Okay, well, wait, because I've got several. So just sit down. <laughs> so be patient. Um, good. <laughs> um, okay, so I just, I, they have questions, so I don't want to hog too much, but I always end up hogging a lot because I have a lot of questions. Um, so how about for the American stuff, was that shot in Georgia then? Yes. So Georgia has become the new Hollywood. Sure. unfortunately because of the tax credit and the film was set the story took place in Kansas City and Kansas City is a very interesting city I went there I went to see how it looked and everything Atlanta is a generic city where you can reproduce a lot of stuff but it's not Kansas City and I really worked hard for us to go there but we couldn't film there so we went to shoot every everything else in in, uh, in Georgia and Atlanta and around Atlanta I thought maybe it was shot in Canada because of the flag and the ice skating rink. I saw it. Oh, <laughs> I thought, yeah. oh, why? Did you shoot in Canada? And then until I saw the peach in the credits, I thought, no, maybe you didn't shoot in Canada. No, it was there when I got there. And, and uh, you're right. I might have, uh, that, that might have been a mistake. I should have uh, taken the, the, the flag out. Uh, I think it was uh, the rink where the uh, Atlanta, um, I think the the, the trashers uh, pl uh, play. Um, uh, they they didn't play there, but they they uh, practiced, had, practiced or something. Yeah, practice. Yeah, they practice there. So maybe that's why they had the Canadian flag because most of the NHL teams have eighty percent players that are. It's a hockey players. ring. So there's, yeah, there's it's a hockey ring. There's bound to be Canadians there. In Atlanta, of all places. So. Yeah, and Reese was a, actually a pretty good skater. And um, and I I put on some skate there to to direct the scene and, and most of the most of the the technical crew uh, was uh, was surprised to see that I was uh, I could also skate <laughs> in addition to, to direct. They, sh they should know better. <laughs> um, we're born with skates. Right. The uh, okay. So I um, can you talk really quick? Someone else probably gonna ask this question about cat about casting your adult actors and and then also working with non-actors and and what's that like for you the difficulty working with non-actors is to is not working with them per se it's to find the right tone the intersection in which both professional actors and non-actors can can play and there's always a risk that it, it'll it will sound like a broken record if if all of a sudden real actors with like real acting 
uh, background come in and they have this 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 tone and and it's okay to start a film with non-professional actors because for the audience things will sound weird or odd for a while but they'll get used to it that's the convention and in this case the, the danger was that the, the, the professional actors didn't come in until like 35 minutes and it's not only professional actors it's a hollywood star parachuted in a film and i think that to this day that might be the one of the problem of the film i think um because all of a sudden you don't are you in a hollywood movie or are you in a a, a more niche uh, movie and 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 that was that was a challenge for me um as far as directing non-professional i think you need to just focus on what they can be naturally and not push them to to make to do stuff that they wouldn't naturally do um there was one guy who had like good acting experience the guy who plays mamir uh and and uh, he is actually the son of a south sudanese refugee and he was uh, never uh born in in africa himself right well they were all great i have one last question before we turn it over to them um, and that is a very random one. Um, I was surprised the first time I watched it, and every time I see it, I forget, and I'm always re surprised, or was surprised again, that there's a song uh, during, I think it's during the ice skating sequence, that's by some guys I know uh, called uh, Monsters Calling Home. Um, that nice little, uh, nice little, uh, you know the song, right? Yeah. Um, how did you happen to find that song? Or do you even know? Was it a music supervisor who said, "Hey, no, out. well, it's uh, for every song there's an, in the movie. I listened to like 150. It's a, it's a, it's a very long process. I like the vibe of that that song. It's uh, from a band. I think the, the name of the band is Run River North. Yeah, well, they were called Monsters Calling Monsters Come Home, and then they had to change their band for some sort of technical reason. So it is Run River North. Run River North, and they're 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 American, but they're all of a uh, Korean origin. Yeah, so, right. Exactly. So when I saw them for the first time, I went to see them in, in LA play, and I arrived there and said, "Wow, okay," because it, there's a very folk feeling to some of their songs. Yeah. So it was a very interesting mix for me, and 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 uh, it's it's just I, I I need to capture something of of the spirit of 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 a, of a moment when I listen to the music, and you want the music not to necessarily either. Um, uh, repeat what the the scene is 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 telling you. You want that the 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 uh, the addition of the scene plus the music to be greater than the sum. And I thought that 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 song worked well there. In normal time, I don't like to use songs in film. This is a very American thing to do, and I went along with it. and And I think we did great. And I did that also in my last American film, Chuck which took, takes place in the 1970s. And in the 70s, there's like pretty good songs there too. So I had a lot of fun. But normally I don't like that that much because it, it feels often very placated and, and, and not, uh, not integrated in, 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 in the movie, but just like put on there to, to, to please the audience. I, don't, I normally don't do that. But in this case, I had a very good music supervisor who was like who was digging and digging and digging and sending me stuff that hadn't been like out yet yeah. on and and on i want to come back on the topic also of uh of directing actors professional and non-professional i think in this case uh, reese did an amazing job at working with them and 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 helping them and they were such good friends on, on the set she actually came also to kakuma refugee camp in, nor in northern uh, kenya uh, without having any scenes there she just came out of uh, solidarity and uh, and she did a very very and she understood also that it was not uh, the film was not about her character she, she had a supporting role in the film and she was instrumental in in uh, finding that intersection uh, i was telling you about right sure Oh, she did a great job too so i'm going to turn it over to these guys and please come and say your name and uh, thank you so much, and we'll see you in a bit. Hi, I'm Lindsay. Hi, Lindsay. I kind of have a loaded question here. I, I read that you originally studied political science and international studies. And so I was kind of curious how and why you segued into film. 
as well as um, how your interest in politics uh, influences what movies you want to film and how you go about filming them? The answer to the first question is, uh, it's, 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 is it, it's, a, it's an accident. I came to do films by accident and it's a nice accident. Uh, but uh, I was doing my master degree in, in Quebec City and, and there was this show going on on the national television in, in Canada called La Course Autour du Monde, which means the race around the world. And every year they would choose eight young amateur filmmaker and send them around the world. It had to be traveling alone with a SVHS camera. Now uh, you're too young to have seen one of those, I'm pretty sure. Uh, and they had to do 20 short films uh, in 26 weeks. So, and I was watching that show on television and one day I applied and just like, not to do the race because I hadn't touched camera in my life, but just to, just like you buy a lottery ticket, you think you're gonna win the million and think about what you're gonna do with that money and it's just fantasizing. And I, I was fantasizing about doing this race, but they called me and then I did an interview and then I did two films and then I went into the finals and next thing I know, they're sending me alone around the, the, the planet to do 20 films in 26 weeks and I go completely crazy. I'm super scared. And the way it works is you would arrive in a country, you would choose, find a subject, shoot it, lock yourself in a hotel room, do the editing plan on paper uh, and all the stuff you wanted in the film, you would send that by FedEx back home and you would move on to the next country. Meanwhile, in, in Montreal, they would edit the film and show it on, on television in front of a panel of judges and your films would get marked. And at the end of the year, the, 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 the contestant who had the, the highest like the, uh, mark won the race. So that's after that, I got, I got people who offered me jobs in documentary and, and intelligence. So that's why I went kind, kind of sideways. Um, and uh, but like you said, I, studying political science always was there for me, and and uh, the good lie is very much that in the way that I think there's a strong social and political canvas in the film that interested me, and I also did a political uh, comedy recently in in Quebec. Monsieur Lazare was also a film with a strong social canvas, and my first film, which was a mockumentary about people unemployed, was very very political called the left side of the fridge so even though i left political science and thank god i'm not working in politics today uh it, it's it's a reflex for me to try to find stuff that has uh at least a social or a political canvas oh, okay um and you actually won that contest i read so um i guess what i would want to know is for us upcoming filmmakers or people interested in film, what advice would you give to us? Um, well, the, the, the thing, I was, we were one man, one woman band with our camera alone filming a, a short film, did the sound, did the scouting, did everything, did the, the editing, all, we did it on paper, but, and, and it was, a, at that time it was something very special because you didn't have the means at home to do a short film. Now today everyone has the means to do a short film at home with, with this and with, with your computer, but not everyone can make a film. So I think the, the, the first thing is that now that the resource is there, if you're really driven, you don't, you, you can't wait for someone to offer you the financial opportunity to make your first few films. You have to shoot them yourself. Second, I think many, many, many people have been uh, have become very competent very fast. I think people now are born competent with the technology of of, of filming and 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 making all these razzle dazzle shots and. And my advice to young filmmakers is not to is ask themselves not how to make beautiful shots, but how to make pertinent shots for the the, the, the things that you you're trying to say in the, the 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 movie that you're trying to do. Always subordinate the form to to what you're trying to convey. And and I think um, your signature is, is is more important than your technical abilities. Thank you. You're welcome. Good luck. Hello, I'm Colton. Hi. Hi, how um, are you? Good. Um, my question is, I noticed 
looking through some of the stuff that you've worked on that a lot of the things you've directed and wrote it as well. I'm just curious kind of what the process of getting those kind of started off, such as like uh, uh, Monsieur uh, Lazar or my internship in Canada. How did you get those, I guess, going? You mean finance? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have, a, we, 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 um, we live in a communist country and everything is state. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, we, we have a very singular and, and quite generous system of film funding in Canada. I mean, 80% of the budget of our films is, is, is funded by the, by, by public money. Uh, not everyone can de get their film financed, so you need to submit the project with a, a producer and with a budget and with a script and with uh, like all kinds of like uh, documents stating your intentions. And sometimes you have to you you go at the bat, and sometimes you swing and you miss, and then six months later you you do the process all over again. But that being said, once once you get the money. Although you can never get a very big, you, we can't do like movies that cost like forty million dollars back home. It's always between two and five is a big, five million is a big budget. Mm -hmm. But once once you get the money, you have like total liberty. And and we, I come I come from a culture where the director has the final cut, even if contractually we don't. The director often. Uh, write is, is script and and we'll we'll get to have the final say artistically although it's I think it's it's a teamwork with the with the producer um, so that's I grew up in that system and and uh, I'm still making a film my next one will be from that system now now I have also opportunities to work in the United States and the the system is very different uh, and and those are films that I have to chase, and I have to convince the direct the producers I'm the right person. And at the end, they can they can make changes to the cut. I, it didn't happen to me on The Good Lie or Chuck, but what happened was I had to make like uh, compromises on The Good Lie, for instance. One of the things I had to do was to make it uh, PG-13. And when you're shooting uh, war sequences where kids are being shot. By 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 soldiers, it's you're you're threading a fine line, and you can't say the half word, and and you can't. And it was a very very good scene with a half word, and we had to take it out when when Reese goes to the uh, I, the the immigration uh, office, and she says, "Who do I have to screw around here?" To I I was on her, and she used to say. Who do I have to fuck around here to see, you know, an official? And the guy would turn around and said, "Me, you can fuck me." And, and that was pretty funny. But we had to take that out to make it PG thirteen. So I had to make changes like that to to because they wanted to reach a, a wider audience with the, the film. And um, yeah, but I'm straying away from you know the question. In Canada, we have a publicly financed mm. <laughs> system. So you need to ask for refugee status and come north of the border. <laughs> <laughs> so, which is a good period to ask for a refugee status, actually. So, in Canada, then, I guess you don't have to kind of make those compromises as much. I'm guessing because you don't have to. You always do, in a way, because you can't make a film in a void. You have partners. You have producers. I. I see it as um, it's it's they will make produ producing decisions, but they take into account what I what I think and vice versa, and um, and sometimes to get the, the additional money from the distributors, which are pr private companies, they want you to cast like people who are have a higher profile so you can make sometimes compromises there sometimes you have to make compromises because you don't have the resources to shoot what you have but this will happen in any films it happens all the time and this is actually uh, good constraints i call it good constraints but in general yes the director is uh sovereign <laughs> on a film in canada cool well, thank you so much thank you Oh. Hey, All right, I'm a little short here. <laughs> My name is Rand. 
And that was a cool framing, by the way, just like like that. You know? <laughs> Works too. <laughs> yeah. so, anyway, I enjoyed your film. It was very heartfelt and everything, and I enjoyed like the details in there. Like there was one detail that really stood out to me, which was um, the scene where the main character is reading Huckleberry Finn, and my question is like. How did you know to put that as like a payoff for like the title of the film for like the good lie when it was like going throughout there? Well, uh, I did. I didn't write the script, but that was uh, part of a long script writing journey from um, from Margaret who wrote the script, uh, and and um, I think these things have to be balanced. I mean, I I I, I think that for a wider audience, these payoff things that you plant in the film like that have to be subtle they have to be contextualized or else they're gonna they're gonna feel fake at, at when 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 you see the payoff at the end but this is something that felt right for me because uh one of the thing that the south sudanese were most interested in when they came to the united states was to get an education and and they could have like three jobs to, just to make sure that they would get an education and if they couldn't all get one they would pay for one of them to have an education so using the huckleberry film was not only about the content of the book and what it said and the title but about the act of learning also and the act of of, of uh and and also putting like an immigrant who didn't go to school because he was in a war zone uh at equal at an equal place with with american citizens who had the opportunity to go to school so that scene for me was also all about that so it made sense to me it didn't didn't feel forced okay yeah, and i really enjoyed did I answer your question or? you did yes because <laughs> like i i like noticing um like small snippets like that because it just makes like the story of the movie more enjoyable like i know it goes like you have to go through like a lot of work to put something that small in there, like very subtle, but it's there. And I just like that you put that there so that it was like a good payoff. And I like I, I like definitely details, and and a lot of it comes from research and talking also to the guys. Because uh, one thing I learned was that when they arrived and got their first apartment, they would they didn't want to sleep in a bed. They they never slept on a bed before. So what. They told me that they what they would do is to sleep together in the, the, the largest room and just bring the mattress down on the floor so that was improvised because of what i got from them as real refugees and and the song also they sang uh was something they would do to put themselves to sleep and and that's an interesting thing because i i asked them try to sing something <laughs> That's like public domain in South Sudan, it's some kind of like old folk music. But you know, it's it's never really public domain. So actually, the guy who wrote that was a blind man living in a refugee camp in Ethiopia, and we had to send someone there with a contract from 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 Warner Brother and like a sum of money to get that the, the rights for that song. But I I'm I'm as happy with the details in the script than. The, the stuff I was able to get from them also, uh, like the toothbrush, for instance, they would use these sticks and just peel them, peel the edge and use that at the, as a toothbrush. And believe me, their teeth are amazing. And so like a, that works. So those little details came from them. Great. Well, thank you. <laughs> Moments pause. Hello. Hi. How are you? I'm Trisha. Good. How are you? Um, so I guess my first question was just kind of what do you look for in scripts when you're looking to do a project, and then my second question I guess would just be like, um, you mentioned how it was different in Canada and in the U.S., and so I was wondering like if you feel like you're more able to tell kind of like the stories you want to in Canada, just because you're not so like strapped for funding and things like that. 
Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll answer your second question first. The thing is, is when I write, I'm a very slow writer. It can take me up to three years to, to write a script. So uh, that means that I, I direct a film every four years. That's, I mean, I'm, I'm uh, getting uh, not old, but uh, not young anymore. And I don't want to make a film every four years. So by working in the United States, it allows me to, to work more often and, and also to have access to material that I wouldn't... Um, I wouldn't think of of doing in the, the first place because I didn't, you know, I was not uh, uh, put into contact with that kind of uh, situation or material. So I read like 300 scripts in the past four years and a half. And what I look for, I don't look for anything. I think looking for something is very hard. I mean, it's like when you're single and you're looking for a girlfriend or boyfriend. It's it's, it's horrible. You you don't find anything. It's it's it doesn't work. You just need to. It's it's like a it's like a meeting. It's it's a, it has to be spontaneous. You, uh, and I think you know, I I what I look for is to be moved in in in, in either in an intellectual way or emotional way. The good life is clearly. I was moved because I had been there and, and um, but after I have to be compelled by the story and I need to ask myself, okay, this is good. This is funny. This is great. I want to see that film. Now the second question, am I the right person to do this film? And sometimes you say, mm, not the right person. Um, and, and this is the humility part in that I, he, if you don't think you have the competence, don't go because you think it's going to be a great film. If it's not for you, if it's it's not for you, also don't do it just for money. Uh, you need to have some personal insights into it. It can be very simple, uh, but you have to have some kind of personal insight. And in for Chuck, I mean, I I knew nothing of like uh, the being a boxer in the seventies in New Jersey. Um, but I knew about uh, uh, telling the story of a cautionary tale about like uh, about uh, people who want to be famous at all costs uh, because I live in a in an industry where fame is you know everybody wants to become famous so I know something about that about narcissism about about other stuff than uh, and. So, and I was also uh, a, a sports fan, so I had like personal insights into these topics. But I think you need to find a personal reason to to say yes to the script. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> hey, how you doing? Good. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm gonna move the camera. I got, I got He's it. got it. Camera. He's got it. So uh, here at UVU, if you throw a rock, you're going to hit a wannabe director in the face. And uh, my question is, what would you say is the most important skill for an aspiring director to develop? Oh, man. I used to go, a few years back, I used to go to colleges or like to school, even high school, people who wanted to win in film class. And I would ask, Okay, how many people here want to direct a movie? And you would get like a lot of people raising their hands. And then I would I would I would follow with how many people who think you're gonna make a living out of it. And then you people would look at each other like, uh oh, is that a quick trick? But you would get two or three people raising their hand. It, it was not a question. It, 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 I'm gonna make movies or I'm gonna die, and it's that that was gonna be it. So you need to be driven because it's. Because first of all, because there are a lot of good directors out there, women and men, and you need to, like I said before, find what makes you singular. Um, I'm when I go see a film, I don't want to be, I want to be entertained and I want to be surprised and I want to be all of this. But what's going to bring me back to the cinema to see another film of that director? Is the voice so you need you need to find what's your personal voice um, but it's a uh, I'm not gonna lie it's perseverance in my in my case I think I was very lucky I was parachuted in this 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 race like I said and I went and when I left the day I left I remember I left because I didn't want to look bad not leaving but I didn't want to leave I was so scared and then I got 
thrown into the arena and and there was like uh, uh, the national television waiting for my films every 10 days so I didn't have a choice so I had that motivation you have to find this this strong motivation this is always the toughest question I'm asked and then this it's kind of the second time tonight and but uh, th there's nobody but you that's gonna find that's gonna tell you why you want to do this uh, for a living that being said there's a lot of way we can communicate cinema is not the only way and there's a lot of very, very cool um, um, professions inside cinema. I mean, sometimes I look at the prop guy, and I want to be a prop guy. And, and, and sometimes I look at uh, what the people do with the, on, in the editors, the, the, uh, the, the people who edit films. This is an art form. It's a very, very high art form. And, and I think a lot of people I've met, young people who wanted to become director, have sometimes they decided to do sound and be sound uh, supervisor or sound designer. And I have a personal friend who, who just won an Oscar for sound for Arrival. He did, he did all my films. And, and this for me was, it, it, these, the, this is a profession that's very noble, that's, that's amazing, that's fascinating, that's very rich. And he gets to work way more often than I do. <laughs> because I, I can only make so many films in, in one life. But so I also encourage people looking at other, other sets of like profession in, in the movie business. All right. Uh, the next question, the last one, uh, maybe this uh, might sound a little personal, which is do you feel as a director that you have made the movies that you want to see? Or do you enjoy watching other movies that aren't necessarily within your purview? I love to watch movies that I, would, I couldn't do. Uh, I love watching them more because if I say a good film that I could have done, I go, I'm super depressed because it's, I, I'm, I'm, I, I say to myself, I'll never be able to be that good. If I see something is completely wild and, and it's, it's, it's completely out of my reach, I'm, I'm not going to envy that that person but if i see a film that i could have done and and i often tell myself i don't think i could do this film better than he or she did then i i go into a deep depression i also go into deep depression when i see the first cut of any of my films really <laughs> because i can measure the gap between my ambition and my talent oh <laughs> this is a very very bad moment and then after that you roll your sleeves and you 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 keep you know, working at it, you but uh, no, I am an eclectic movie goer. I like a lot of stuff, really a lot of stuff from, from Spielberg to Ken Loach. I don't really discriminate. I discriminate. I, I, I hate lazy movies um, and, and, and lazy dialogues or expository dialogues. And there's some stuff I really don't like, but I don't discriminate in, in, in genres. And I think we should, as filmmakers, be interested in all our, the genres, even even if we make the same film over and over again. All right. Thanks, man. Have a good evening. Thanks. Hey, thanks for your time tonight. Hey. Uh, so my first question for you is just, because I'm really interested in cinematography and I really enjoyed watching the movie, and we talked a lot about the story already, kind of the political background and stuff. Um, but I was also just curious in determining kind of like the visual language and how you're going to tell your story, like actually through the images, not just through the script. What was kind of your process and how did you come to make it the way it, it, the way it is? You know, that was, there was three things. First, the first thing was a constraint. I mean, I didn't have a lot of days and I knew I couldn't come in on the set and have like elaborate setups. So I knew I had to find a form that would be manageable. The second thing is I, I, I didn't want, even though I was going to Africa and I knew there was going to be beautiful landscape, I didn't want to go uh, uh, the, the, uh, the ratio to uh, the, 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 the widescreen ratio because I needed proximity. And I think the, uh, the uh, 185 aspect rate ratio gives a better sense of proximity intimate proximity with the 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 uh the actors uh it's it's a, a little bit less uh aesthetical but it gives a bit more feeling that you are close to them at least in 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 my view 
Um, so those were the parameters we discussed uh, before going to shoot because arriving in Africa and I was seeing a landscape and said, oh, we, you know, you're tempted to do these like out of Africa shots. <laughs> Uh, but it, they've they've been made before, and it's not the point of that movie. And it's, uh, um, so I, I I wanted to be close to the kids, and I wanted to be most of the time handheld, so I could shoot faster and 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 uh, try to fit the the whole production in in the the short time we had. <laughs> cool. All right. Thank you for your time. All right. Thank you. I think we have one more. How are you holding up? So I think we have one more person. How are sure, you? Sure. Good? Right, I'm good. Okay. Yeah. Hello. Hi. My name is Taylor Jensen. Hi. Hi. Yeah, okay. That works. It's fine. Uh, sorry. This is probably going to be a really cliche question. Um, but of course, in order to be like decent in film, you want to have like a somewhat um, thorough cinematic literacy you want to know what's out there and stuff like that but if you had to pick like the top three or the top five films that a filmmaker should see which ones would you choose mm. this is just a moment we i guess i look sorry um someone is giving me the answers i have two cards <laughs> the cue card is gone no um uh, 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 uh. There's, 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 it's, it's, it's impossible to answer that. There, okay, first of all, um, if I, if, if someone asks me to go do a master class, and I will go there and I will say, first of all, let's not call this a master class. There is nothing. There's no master on this planet. There was a few. There were a few. There might be one left. So, I try to motivate people to find their own way to work and make films, and not just you know mimic what other people do so i think you need to see a maximum of films but at the same time i think what got me into this business oddly was when i started to make these films around the world and when i came back my 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 culture was my cinema culture was very limited it was limited to hollywood pics that i've seen in my like small town in quebec I never seen a, a film from Europe. I've never seen, you know, I, and and this was a, a disadvantage and an advantage because when I started writing the first script, I never took a course. I I didn't read the manual, <laughs> uh, the instruction manual, so I didn't have any preconceived idea about what's an inciting incident, what's a plot point, what's a need, what's a want, what's a you know the things that will eventually make you go crazy when you write a script. And so I was just, it just, I just blurted out stuff that I wanted to do. And I had this camera, which was like a complex thing, but a simple thing at the same time. It's like, oh, let's, let's try to do something. The only tool I had was what I felt was right, which for me, what makes a real filmmaker it, and, and, and which makes personal film. So that's the advantage. Now, as you, as I grew older, I saw more films and I keep watching films. And I, I the more I watch films, the more I see how I know nothing about cinema, and it, it can become very overwhelming at times. But I would n ask people to see very, very different stuff, and I would ask people to at least see the five films that are nominated in the foreign language ca category each year. I'm not saying that they're always good, but I they're always very different than what comes from the United States. And I think from you guys, you need to, you have access to, of course, like the big films, like everyone, but you need to find a way to, to see other stuff. And, and that's it. Uh, yeah. So I'm not answering your question. <laughs> <laughs> that being said, my, my favorite film is uh, Lawrence of Arabia. I think it's the most fascinating character in cinema history. Okay. Thank you so much for being with us here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Philippe, I think we're done. Unless right. anyone is being shy. I mean, yeah, all I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm, I'm, uh, it's, uh, it's bedtime. I'm going to, no, I'm going to watch some, like some, some movie after. So I'm, I'm, I'm staying up.
if there's any right. other questions. <laughs> no, no last final people. All right. Hey, thank you so much. This was great. Everything you said was spot on and perfect. Your movies are brilliant. Can't wait to see Chuck. Haven't seen it yet, but uh, but um, definitely, uh, def I'm a definite fan. So thank you so much for for your time. I really appreciate it. No, thank you. It was fun. Thanks a lot. I hope yeah. it was uh, useful. Thank you, sir. All right. Good night.